these type studies, these and others, have really come together to be the underpinning of the neurohormonal model. What does that model say? That gestational hormones set sexual identity and orientation during that gestational period. That the absence of testosterone results in feminization. That the presence of testosterone masculinizes the fetus. Before we go on, let's just stop for a moment and think about that. What we're talking about are hormones that are present or absent during gestation. As soon as this kind of information became available, you know what happened. People said, all right, we have a treatment. We can just treat homosexuals with hormones and turn them into heterosexuals. Does that work? No, it does not work. In fact, if you look at adult men homosexual and heterosexual, they have the same level of testosterone. As adults, they're not missing testosterone or they don't have too much testosterone. It's the same. And if you give testosterone to any of them, you will increase their libido, but you will not change their orientation. It has a known effect. And the effect is not to change the orientation. Okay, so let's go back to our gestational story here. I told you that the important things happen between the 8th and 16th week of gestation. During this time, the hormones that are present affect all of the body tissues so that Male body type is different from female body type. Our neuronal development is different. Males have a different neuronal development than females. Our brain functions are different. There is a long list of things that are different. These are only three. All of these are determined at the same time, this gestational age of 8 to 16 weeks, and they are determined under the influence of these hormones. Therefore, if you have a male characteristic for neuronal development, you will have a male characteristic for body type and a male characteristic for brain function. One becomes a marker for the other because they're all under the control of the same hormonal milieu. This is what we call sexual dimorphism where there are characteristics that are different between males and females. And I've just tried to symbolically display this with colors and symbols. There are lots of different characteristics in which we see sexual dimorphism. Neuroanatomy. We see sexual dimorphism in a particular part of the brain called INAH3. Brain function. There are differences. There are differences in hypothalamic activation. There are differences in functional cerebral asymmetry. There are differences in the way we hear in autoacoustic emissions that are emissions from our inner ear. Females are different from males. Prepulse inhibition has to do with the way you blink your eye. That is a, a characteristic that you can measure that's different. None of these are things that you could learn to do. You can't sit and think how to blink your eye differently or how to hear differently or how to have a different type of hypothalamic activation. You cannot be trained to do that. So these are very objective ways that we can look at the differences that those hormones make during gestation. And finally, body type, anthropometric differences can also be measured. So we're going to look at some of these, not only how they differ between males and females, but how do they differ between straight males and gay males and straight women and gay women. 
So what does our model predict? Our model predicts that if you have testosterone present during gestation, whether it is a male fetus or a female fetus, that these children will grow up to be adults who are attracted to females. If you have testosterone absent during gestation, regardless of whether you have a male or a female fetus, then the adult will be attracted to males. We call the first case straight males the second, lesbian females, the third, gay males, and the fourth, straight females. And this is the model that I want you to keep in mind as we look at the different studies that have been done. So for these sexually dimorphic characteristics, we are going to ask the question, are there male patterns in lesbian females? And are there female patterns in gay males? That's what our model would predict. So on to neuroanatomy, just where I thought you would be wanting to go this afternoon. <laughs> okay. That little yellow part there in that half brain that you see is the hypothalamus. The little box around it really highlights the anterior part of the hypothalamus, and it's that area that's strongly associated with choice of sexual partners. We know that from animal studies. We can actually go in and destroy that part in an animal and see the difference in their behavior. There's even a smaller part of that anterior hypothalamus that's called the interstitial nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus, and there are actually four areas of that. In three of the, those areas, area one, two, and four, both males and females look the same. Same number of cells, same volume of that tissue, no difference. But in area number three, there are differences. In that area, there are more cells and a larger volume in males than in females. Knowing that they, there are those differences between heterosexual males and heterosexual females, a study was done to look at homosexual males and to see their number of cells and the volume of that area in their brains. Obviously, these are all autopsy studies. And what they found was that homosexual males look the same as heterosexual females, just exactly what our model would predict.